I'm really sorry for this episode being so late, but with all my excitement of having Neil Malarkey on my show, I didn't hit the save button and I've had to do some jiggery pokery to get this lost episode back. Anyway, I talked to Neil Malarkey. He is an improv guy. He set up the comedy store and he is doing amazing things, teaching people in corporate how to do improv. Now, I played an amazing song for him today, which was Sit Down by James. And we talk about that, first of all. But I go into all kinds of different things and ask him loads of questions. And we get a little bit of interaction from the audience as well. Absolutely amazing interview. I hope you enjoy it. So, without any further ado, here's Neil. You put the singer off, Neil. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome. Welcome, sir. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm very well. It's kind of summer, isn't it? So I put a summery shirt on. You said wear yellow. I don't have any yellow. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's not a problem. I'll I'll do the yellow. So <laughs> the very first question I ask my guests is, why did you choose that song? It's such a brilliant song, isn't it? It's so good. Um, the lyrics, of course, the one that really stands out for me is those who find themselves ridiculous sit down next to me. Yeah, brilliant. So I find myself ridiculous. Anybody who doesn't find themselves a little bit ridiculous, I think, should worry. Uh, because you think bizarre things that came out of my head. Why did I do that? What am I doing? What the heck's going on? How could I? Oh, and I, I'm very happy when people admit they find themselves confusing. <laughs> so, uh, and this, the idea of sit down next to me is kind of the co- collegiate, the collective. We're all in it together, no matter who we are, but we can sit down in empathy. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and when I'm trying to sing and you started sitting down as well, that was funny. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. So for those people that do not know who Neil Malarkey is, tell us a little bit about yourself, please, Neil. Neil Malarkey. Malarkey is my real name, although people think it's made up because I come from the world of comedy. I desperately wanted to be a comedian when I was doing my A-levels. I Uh, went to university, came out, started doing the comedy circuit in the 1980s, met Mike Myers of Shrek and Austin Powers. We did a double act, Malarkey and Myers. He taught me improv. So then the comedy store players were formed and I'm still doing that every Sunday, which I love. I've done movies and stuff like that. But about a quarter of a century ago, I thought I want to use those skills we use on the stage of improv, of listening, of creativity, of collaboration, further afield so i teach that to people in business in organizations being in the moment really listening uh coping with imperfection coping with the ridiculous coping with difference and i love it because it means i'm helping people monday to friday and more not just sunday evenings so i teach improv and that's the thing and that's how i met you because i met michael heppel and it's just been such a beautiful thing to follow my desire to bring this thing to people, not just on stage. No, that is is incredible. Because the thing is, um, we we were chatting um, before, uh, talking about music and stuff, and, and, you know, being being on stage entertaining, it's a, you you can only do it a little bit of a time, can't you? But so, so what you're doing is you're bringing your passion and your love to then do more of it and, and, and do, and do other stuff as well, which is absolutely fantastic. I, I, some of the training courses that I've been on um, in my sales career. Uh, yeah, a- absolutely. I wish we'd have found you. I wish well, we'd have found exactly, you. Exactly, because again, um, I was asked to do some sales courses and I said, I don't know how to do that. And then somebody else said, well, just use the improv skills, which is listen, work with what they're giving you. That's selling, isn't it? And then somebody yeah. else said, you don't have to teach them how to sell. Just teach them how not to sell. <laughs> so yeah. we do bad sketches. You know, that's the best way of training people sometimes is to show them how not to do it. And I can do that. Um, so I, I broaden it. When I first started, I thought, well, improv is all about listening, listening to what she's saying. She's listening to you. We do a scene together. Wherever we go, we're going to go there together. And then it's got applications. I have learned leadership, business development, teamwork. There's so many applications and also kind of the idea, the ethos of the improv mindset, which is I can't control what's going on in the world. How do I then 
cope. <laughs> and mm -hmm. it's rather wonderful to say, well, actually, once you as a leader, you're in charge, but you're not in control, that becomes liberating. And when I first dipped my toe, I thought I had an idea about what improv could be, about listening, working together. And then uh, there's all sorts of leadership models, which all about we don't know what's going on. We have to work in an uncertainty and less than perfect information. And also, eventually, I realized when people say to me at the end of a day of an improv workshop, I'm teaching them these skills and going quite highbrow. And they say, you know what? We had a laugh today with each other today we rarely do that and i think well maybe i've just that's what i should do just accept that if we can laugh together we'll probably work together better yeah I, i'm guessing i if i if i was in a, a team and, and, and our team came to your workshop we'd be a lot better bonded at the end wouldn't we you would because you'll have seen each other not being perfect mm. you'll have seen the person who plays by my rules, listen, accept, yes, and, as opposed to yes, but, being creative, being imaginative, being funny. That person who thinks, I've just got to do jokes, they realise, actually, no, that's not the thing. Jokes are selfish and closed-ended, and it's all about going on the journey together, creating the story. So you would be beautifully bonded because you've lived through a, an experience where you think, oh, gosh, it's going to be a bit scary. I've got to tell jokes. And by the end, you go, no, jokes was the very last thing we needed. It was actually the listening and working together and accepting. We don't know the answer sometimes, but together, if we work together, we'll find perhaps the next step. Yeah, no, absolutely. Someone who was listening, uh, Richard, <laughs> he, right. he, said, he said, it's a nice shirt, not at all ridiculous. So there you go. <laughs> absolutely thank, you, uh, thank you, Richard. This was a gift, as are my best things in life, from my wife, who's a very tasteful person. So that's why she chose me. <laughs> Excellent. So what I also do with, with these um, um, behind the profile, I want, I want to find out a little bit more about what people are doing on LinkedIn. So how do you find LinkedIn is helping you with your business then, Neil? I love, I love LinkedIn because everyone's nice with each other. And it's a lovely way of connecting with people you maybe haven't seen for a while or half know or somebody who does know you saying you must meet her. And then she gets in touch. And I, I could do with something of what you do. And there's so many resources there, interesting articles and so forth. So I've just written a book and I, there's so many articles I found on LinkedIn where I could say, oh, right, I'm talking about my improv thing. And then actually I talk about sometimes you've got to be scripted and prepared like you were today with sit down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sometimes, you know, things need to be prepared and structured and sometimes you need to be improvised. Anyway, I found so many articles via LinkedIn and, and it kind of I love meeting people. And I also love being reminded of moments that I shared with people. And LinkedIn is perfect for that. Uh, nobody's too upset if you send them an invite. I'm not too upset if somebody invites me to join their gang. I do get a bit upset, though. I'm sure, Ashley, you know this, where you kind of somebody you vaguely know, perhaps, or they know somebody, you know, yeah, OK, join. You can come to my virtual house. And they start. They haven't read my website. Don't read what I do. Great long blurb, blurb, blurb. Spend $300,000 on a new website or whatever. Make connections. Are you lacking sales leads? And look, I'm a one man band. I don't need that kind of thing. You haven't read who I am. Um, they pretend they do. Yeah. And, and um, so I've, I've noticed uh, an uptick of the amount of these messages that I'm getting. Uh, and so what you can do um, in, the, in the message, at the very top of the message, there's, there's three dots. And if you click on three dots, you can hit block um, and report. And so therefore you, you mark it as spam because you didn't ask for it. So it is spam. And then you click block and then you'll never hear from them ever again. And they do not get, they do not get a message saying Neil doesn't like you and he's blocked you. <laughs> they just will never hear from you again. And they won't be able to see you ever again either. Um, yeah. Because there are, there are some um, tools out there that you can program and it'll, it'll find people and then message them automatically. That's not how we do business. We build a relationship. We get to know somebody. We get to like somebody. We get to trust them. And, and that, that's what it's all about. So, so if you start doing more of the, the blocking and reporting, then yeah. it will stop those people from doing that. Yes. But yeah, it, it, I, it, is, I, it is annoying. I have done that, actually. I must say they've calmed down a bit. But it's very nice <laughs> that they don't know you've blocked them. Uh, Richard, I was saying about my books. Thank you very much indeed. This was in lockdown. I was doing lots of pilot workshops on Zoom with people and somebody said, oh, just color coordinate your books. 
So an hour and a half, April 2020, I colour coordinated um, and Richard's worried, but we've always got something to talk about. Somebody loves it, somebody hates it, but we've always got chatting. We can talk about the colour codes of my book. Although, Richard, I'm worried that you, you're you looking at that rather than looking at Ashley and, and me and really understanding what we're talking about here. <laughs> I get I get it with the guitar, so so, so don't worry about it. Uh, Richard's also saying that um, smiling makes people more receptive to both the message and the messenger and the message, laughing even more so. Imagine business without human, not the humour, not the kind of business I'd want to be in. Absolutely, Neil, eh? Yeah, well, exactly. Now, I've got a chapter about humour in the book, and I say humour isn't banter, that thing where we, we laugh at somebody else. We say, you're not in our gang, you're different from us. Humour is that, for me is we're all slightly ridiculous. We're all possible of making a complete hash of things. It's not forced jollity. You've got to dress up as a chicken for comic relief. It's just those moments over the coffee. Uh, you know, you bump into somebody in the elevator. It doesn't have to be ha ha ha. It can be um, just appropriate. There's a book called Humor Seriously from Stanford Business School where they talk about humor and just has to be appropriate. Just a little funny PS or a smile, a little PS in your email, whatever. Doesn't have to be laugh out loud. And I've spent 25 years and I've traveled to 25 countries. I've never yet met somebody who didn't have a sense of humor. They may be different from mine. They may be different from yours, but there's always something that can make them smile. And very often, because improv, it's based on something we did together. I'm not doing jokes about Boris Johnson. I just pick up the vibe they're giving me and just maybe a few minutes later mention something they mentioned. Um, and that's all it is often. It's just treating what somebody says as an offer. Oh, right. They've said something about chicken, about skis or cheese, whatever. A few minutes later, you mentioned chicken or cheese. Um, so that's the simple thing. In fact, I was uh, I know you talk to a lot of accountants. I've just had a thing published by the ICAEW. I didn't even know what that stands for that they put on LinkedIn about. It's OK. Accountants and humor. It's OK. My brother's an accountant. His favorite sketch is that Monty Python sketch. But I've met lots of accountants who are all very different. There's no such thing as one stereotype, one archetype. We've met we've met very silly accountants, very serious comedians. We're all yeah. different. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, so I've, I've been working with, with accountants for uh, 16 years now, Neil. And um, everyone's got this, like you say, this stereotype for a, for an accountant. You know, they've got, they've, got, um, they've got those jackets with the leather patches on the elbows and they've got a load of pens in the top pocket and they talk very nasally. But all of the accountants that I've met are absolutely great fun. So, so yeah, that, that's, that's the thing. Um, so you wanted to go into comedy, did, did you plan to be a stand-up comedian and, and that was the, the route? Or, or Well, um, Charles is just about you curating your LinkedIn feed. And it's a good idea. Take. <laughs> oh, there we go. Thank you, Iman Razak. Um, I wanted to be a doctor. So I did chemistry, physics, maths, A-level. But then I was in the school play and I thought, oh, I like this. Just like how you on stage singing, there's such a buzz. Yeah. Comedy has a similar buzz. People are laughing. I want more of that. And so I went to Cambridge University, the Cambridge Footlights, where Monty Python had been, yep. and Stephen Fry, Hugh Laurie, Emma Thompson, Olivia Coleman, loads of people got to be president. Then my dad said, do you want to do this as a job? And I said, yes. So there's obviously a bit of because uh -uh, one brother is an accountant, one's a chemical engineer and I'm the comedian. So <laughs> I remember my mum just after I graduated going to this you know, Pucky University saying, oh, yes, Neil. She was on the phone. Neil, yes, he's trying to break into show business. Um, but the joy of it is, is the comedy store players who've been going for 38 years, which is longer than either of my brothers have managed to keep one of their jobs with a certain company. So I win. Hooray. So at Cambridge, uh, we uh, we did a, a review, a sketch that we then took to Australia. That was great fun. We brought it back. We started playing a small theatre in Notting Hill and there was a bloke selling tickets. He'd heard of Cambridge Footlights and he was Mike Myers. He started talking about improv. We started doing a double act. We formed the Comedy Store Players with Kit Hollaback and Paul Merton and Dave Cohen. And that's kept going. Mike's uh, then had to go back. To, he went back to live in Toronto. His dad wasn't too well, but we kept in touch. But improv sort of to took over my life. So there was this thing of wanted to be a doctor, 
then doing comedy, and then kind of what I do now, this may be forcing it a bit, but I love bringing humor and improv to help people, like a business doctor, if you like, or uh, uh, not, not that I'm a therapist, but sometimes people just need a laugh, and sometimes giving them a, a different point of view of how do they, do they communicate, can they borrow some improv, is actually incredibly healthy for them as a team, as an, uh, as an individuals as well. So um, I feel that, you know, comedy was the thing that called me. I didn't tell my parents. If I hadn't got to be in the footlights, I probably would have done actually something like I'm doing now. I was interested in, in working in um, how organisations uh, look after themselves. I did psychology and sociology. So I would have probably done what I've done now, but I've, I would have come from a more conventional angle. No, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, so this, this comedy still players. Have you been there every Sunday for the last 38 years, Neil? <laughs> Not quite. I allow myself to go on holiday. Okay. Um, if, if I've got a better paying gig somewhere, which sometimes happens with corporate things, you know, they ask you, could you fly to uh, Zurich, uh, fly to Shanghai or whatever? That doesn't happen a lot, but uh, it has happened. Um, so every Sunday, in fact, we used to do Wednesdays as well. Wow. Um, we're doing Wednesday, December 20th. So for quite a long time, we're doing twice a week. And... People used to say you're working four hours a week. And I, yeah, it's quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing what I love. Um, and then I had this idea. I don't want to do it four hours a week, but I do it, you know, nine to five as well uh, with organizations. But uh, I have done loads of shows, uh, probably more than 10,000 hours of improv. But I'm still learning. We have lots of guests, people who are way younger than us, who've done improv with other groups. And they come and play with us. And we think, wow, they're good. How can we steal a bit of that? Um, so it's it's an endlessly enlightening and joyous thing. Sunday evening, everyone's a bit down, perhaps it's a school night. And then they come and they come away from our show just delighted because they've seen us be fallible, but enjoying mm. the collaboration. Um, so back when you started, were they teaching improv? at universities and acting colleges no are they no. teaching it now yes they do they do teach it i know the university of kent has a course uh, about comedy and improv and there's lots of improv courses but when i was a lad and the comedy store players started in 1985 before you were born actually oh you're so kind <laughs> <laughs> well i noticed by the way in the chat about this somebody talked about daktari now put in the chat anybody who even remembers daktari what the cross-eyed um, the cross-eyed lion called Clarence? Clarence, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so improv was a thing. They, people do improvised scenes in England or in UK, which is you kind of you're 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 devising material. But actually, improv had started in Chicago in the 1920s with a social worker teaching children just some exercises to give them confidence, and it was her son who used the exercises to become a form of theatre. So by 1959, Second City had started in Chicago, which I'd heard of because of saturday night live yep. specifically the blues brothers they'd come from second city before saturday night live and that's why when mike myers said i've come from second city canada i was excited i didn't know they did improv so mike taught us it along with kit hollerbuck i mentioned her before she'd worked in san francisco with robin williams so they taught us this stuff and it was really quite unusual this was before whose line is it anyway which popularized mm. it in the uk um, but people still find it odd. You go on stage and you do a show for two hours where you don't have a script. Yep. You're mad. Yep. Yeah, it makes no sense. But the audience knows it's made up on the spot. So they're not judging you like they would judge a scripted piece where they go, well, that's good. They'll do it again tomorrow night. They did it last night. Whereas we're going, we don't have a script. We're going to do it for you tonight. So, for example, um, the other day, Plunger became just a running joke with everyone. The week before it was Bertolt Brecht. For some reason, I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> so you kind of say tonight's special to you. So we have people who come and see every single show. You ask about me being there every Sunday. We have people who come to lo loads of shows. We have people who've met each other sitting in the front row at the comedy store players. Then they bring their children once they're 18. Um, there is this ongoing thing because every show is different. It's kind of it feels fresh and new and exciting to me, no matter how long I've been doing it. Yeah, because um, I don't know how long the mousetrap um, runs in London as well. And what's that, 65 odd years it's been running now? Something like Could that, you yeah. imagine doing that day in, day <laughs> well, out? And well, you know who's done it. 
well, I knew I do know people, and you know, they do it for a year, and that's a real skill to bring yeah. it to life every day as yeah. if you knew. It's a great gig in some respects because you you're staying at home. You know where you got you are. I think they get holiday. If you you've got a family, you kind of can work your life around that. That's fine. I wouldn't be very good at that because when I have done scripted plays and pieces, I'm just hoping something will go wrong <laughs> to um, make it a little bit more fun. <laughs> bring it to life, yeah. Um, so that's fine. Um, but we actually we're pretty much the same people who've been there nearly all that time. Whereas the mousetrap, they change the cast every year. I think. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, Josie Lawrence is still there. Uh, I've been there and uh, Lee Simpson and Richard Vranch. We're still there. When Greg Proops is in town, he comes to play with us. Mike McShane, the same. So we're pretty much, uh, that's why I say we're trying to find some older people, but we have people, <laughs> sorry, younger people. You know, we, we've been there a long time. So a lot of people actually, like, um, who, who saw Josie on Whose Line Is It Anyway, were inspired to go and try improv at school or college because of this brilliant woman. No, fantastic. Uh, before I forget, you keep mentioning your book and I can see a few behind you. Um, let's, let's, let's give that book a shout out, please. It's called In The Moment and it says a creative masterclass for every moment, says Mike Myers, who kindly uh, read the book and told me that's what he thought. But basically it's about my 25 years of teaching improv and to people. And also I then say, actually, there are times you don't want improv being in the moment, being uh, adaptable. Sometimes you've got to be scripted. You've got to be fully aware of your budget, your strategy. The worst thing is somebody giving a presentation where they're making it up as they go along. Almost yeah. as bad <laughs> as somebody in a conversation which needs a bit of give and take, selling or coaching or dealing with your direct report who's feeling a bit down, sticking to the script. So there are moments when you've got to be scripted. There are moments when you've got to be prepared to improvise. So why not borrow some of our techniques and also teach, you know, just presentation skills, you know, learn your lines or actually bullet points. Make sure you don't overrun, uh, rehearse it, get there early, make sure the mic works. Just like you actually did a sound check yep. for music. You've got to have a sound check. So um, when you're doing a talk, suddenly you've got to have a radio mic and everything like that. And people think, oh, gosh, I don't know what to do. So get there early. Rehearse. Get a friend to sit at the back. Can you hear me? Um, my shoes are really clumpy on this platform. Where do I stand? Where's the lectern? Oh, the clicker doesn't work. All the stuff. You've got to be prepared, structured, organized. And, and who's the book aimed for, Neil? I'll it's hold it up aimed, again. It's actually aimed at anybody who wants to get on. <laughs> um, there's quite a lot of stuff I've I've talked about. My own stories, I've borrowed some behavioral science. Um, it's for me, what I find is what I teach people in their later years, shall we say, some of them have got it through experience, which is actually sometimes you've got to roll with the punches. Sometimes it's okay for you to not know. In fact, your job is to kind of encourage others to come up with ideas. But what if you're 20 or 30 and thinking, I've got to know all the answers. How can you live with not knowing? The improv mindset is being comfortable with uncertainty. So it's aimed at anybody who thinks they'd like to work in an organization. Ashley, you and I don't work in organizations. Um, we, because we've, we've been there and done that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. But most people do have to. You've yep. got to compromise. Uh, you've also got to speak up in the meeting. You've got a great idea. Speak up, for goodness sake. So uh, generally, it's for people who are thinking, oh, how can I have a little shortcut that will save me 10 years of the university of life? Yeah. So perfect. I talk about creativity, storytelling, collaboration, uh, serendipity. We talk about serendipity, don't we, in the arts? It's a mistake and a happenstance becomes really helpful. Yeah. Sometimes that can help you in your career, being open to the idea of an, a left field notion. Uh, I talk about the human connection, and that's really important, especially now we're going remote, actually. I don't know if you find this with people saying, oh, well, it's not face to face. It's not as good. Well, get used to it. If we're only yeah. going to the office three days a week, the other two, you've got to you've got to understand how to make this work. Now, things like I'm standing up. I think it works better when you're presenting. Uh, so are you. Well, there's energy, isn't there? Yes, I'm absolutely. Sure there's a bit of light on my face. You're not seeing up my nose. Um, I made the person next door who's doing some grinding of stone be quiet for half an hour. Uh, <laughs> just things like that. How do we bring the fun, actually, and the connection and the collaborative spirit of an improv show 
to a Teams meeting on a Tuesday morning. Brilliant. First of all, get it organized. Secondly, when you need to have an actual conversation, be open to possibilities and really listen, especially to that person in the top right corner who doesn't seem to be listening. Uh, get Bring her in, bring him in, those people whose voices aren't always heard, especially on virtual meetings. Yeah, no, absolutely brilliant. And uh, Mark is shouting out that it's a brilliant book, so absolutely superb. Um, So is there an industry that that would work absolutely brilliant for you and an industry that wouldn't if you you know if I, if I was running a business and like, oh neil i've heard how amazing you are come in and teach us do you turn around and go no i'm sorry i can't do anything there or <laughs> or, or and, and and conversely when i turn around and go i'm running this business you go, yes i love working with these people who, who are they well, I, to be honest with you i work with everybody uh, mm, you, you would say oh no accountants lawyers management consultants they're all left brain type but the, is they a, they love it, and B, quite often, some of them need it because actually it's what they, they, they really need a little bit more of in their, in their job. A lawyer said to me the other day, after 15 years, I've realized it's not so much the quality of my advice as the quality of the relationship. Do they trust me? Will they come to me with a problem early? Uh, so I've worked all over the world as well with all different sectors. So, I mean, advertising agencies, uh, tech firms, uh, school children, um, the NHS, really helpful in the NHS when they have to deal with uncertainty and you've got different groups saying, we must do this. No, we must do that. Silo thinking. I'd never heard of silos other than nuclear silos or in farming. But a lot of <laughs> organizations come to me. We're in silos. We're a bit stuck. Or we've got an organization where two bits have come together. Um, so there isn't a, a, there isn't an industry I haven't worked with. Uh, there are ones where they'll say to me, oh, we're a little bit this. It'll be a bit of a stretch. And you know what? I enter the room. I, I go at the pace that's required. Oh, look, Charles is saying, <laughs> there you go. I, I work with construction firms, uh, of, of, um, architects, engineers. And, you know, I don't obviously leap in. An easy audience, if you like, is salespeople, which is they're always looking for new ways to kind of enter the lair of the customer. And uh, if I'm talking about being bold and listening and suspending your script, that's what's quite interesting for them. On the other hand, sometimes they're going thinking, I've got to do all my sales collateral. I've got 12 questions to ask. I must do all of them, um, which isn't necessarily helpful. So uh, I go at the pace of the audience. So there's always an initial feeling, some people saying, you know, sometimes they do at the comedy store, which is, eek, I've got to tell jokes, it's stand-up comedy. No, it's not. It's ensemble, working, collaborative, creative. But by the end, they love it. And they're saying, when can I do more? And, and saying, can I sign up for a course? And there are many improv courses now uh, around the country. You can do them in person or on Zoom. Uh, sign up for an improv course. Not a single person I've suggested uh, when they've done it has come back and said anything other than this has changed the way I relate to people, the way I present and the way I feel confident about myself, even when I don't know the answers to everything. Brilliant. Brilliant. What a great way to end a show. Um, I've got one last question. I got one last question. Um, Richard just said here, remote in 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 many ways is better. Uh, the problem is there's a lot of second rate online training and meetings out there. There certainly is, Richard. Um, and Richard's doing his bit to try and get more people on camera. So uh, yeah, that's great stuff. Um, in a hugely uncertain world, being able to be comfortable with improv is a great skill. And and yeah, I, I think we've learned an awful lot chatting to you today, Neil. So my my last question to you is: What advice would you give your sixteen year old self? Follow your dream. It sounds oh, dull, doesn't it? No, no, it doesn't. Uh, it's, it's, I it's... really want, when I was 16, I think I was in the school play. I really wanted to do this as a career. Uh, my parents were worried when I admitted it three years later. Um, even somebody years later who directed a show I was in, my mum asked, should he do this? And he said, no, he shouldn't. <laughs> and he's apologized to me since. And I'm saying, don't, don't apologize. It was good advice at the time. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's a crazy job doing showbiz. It's very insecure. You don't get a pension. Luckily, I found a way to make it s sustainable. So yeah. I would say, um, so follow your dream. On the other hand, by the time you're 30, your dream will have changed. Yeah. I was reading an article there about purpose and, uh, Go for it now and realize that in five years time or five months time, 
it may have changed. Be bold. Um, don't say no to yourself. Because I talk about improv is about yes and. And the, the biggest yes but is often to ourselves. Yes, but I'm not good enough. Yes, but I couldn't do that. Yes, but they're not my type of people. Yes, and you can co-create with others something that you might not have expected. No, oh, perfect advice. Neil, you've been an absolute delight on my show today. Thank you so much for saying yes when I asked you. Uh, it's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you to everybody uh, for all their lovely comments and, and what have you. And uh, well, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ashley. And thank you everyone out there in LinkedIn land. Cheerio now. Go. Another podcast in the bag. I've been Ashley Leeds. You've been wonderful. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to hear more, then please subscribe and I will see you again another day. You can find me on LinkedIn if you want to catch up. If you fancy being a guest on one of my shows, I do live shows on LinkedIn twice a week, but I also plan to do some real podcasts uh, where we just do audio and probably record it to go on the YouTube channel. And we can talk about absolutely anything in those. So whatever you want to do, get in touch. And thank you for listening. You get out what you put in. Never gonna lose, never gonna win. As long as you're happy, you're always gonna grin. You get out what you put in. You get out what you put in. You get out what you put in.